This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. So glad to be with you today. We're going to talk today about Noah's flood. Literal flood that flooded this whole earth completely, 100% covered over the top of the tallest mountain on the earth. And this was a flood that God caused. Now it did rain. A lot of people think that the flood only consisted of it raining 40 days and 40 nights. But let's look at verse 11 of chapter 7 of the book of Genesis. Genesis. It said in the 600th year, now Noah was 600 years old. He had, was 500 when God talked to him. He was 120 years building the ark. And uh, so now he was 600 years old. Actually, he was 400 and something years old when God told him to build the ark. And the years of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains, all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Now the windows of heaven were open, and diluges of rain came from heaven. Remember, when God took the heavens and the earth, and he decorated this earth, when he came to it, it said the earth was without void, without form and void, and the water was upon the face of the deep, and the water was upon the earth too. And God took his hand, he separated the water from beneath and the water above, and he put the water up in the sky, and for 1,656 years there was a canopy of water over this earth. And then when God wanted to go ahead and have Noah's flood, he was going to change the whole earth, the whole status of the whole situation after that. He was going to keep the water here on the earth and put the water in clouds. And that's how the water is stored above the earth. It is stored in clouds. All over the earth there are clouds holding millions of gallons of water and thousands and thousands of gallons of water in different places. In some places it's dry. There are no clouds over the desert. There are no places where the water is. If God wants to water the desert, he has to blow the clouds in there from somewhere else and open them up and pour down on the desert. And by the way, when he does that, the desert blossoms and becomes alive. So that does happen periodically. But anyway, here we are back 1,656 years after God had created man, made the earth, put man on the earth and man had rebelled. Man rebelled against God just like the devil rebelled against God. And the devil wanted to make himself a equal with God and be on a pedestal where people would bow down to him. Because he was between God and man, he would have took the place of the Son of God, which was Jesus Christ, and people would have bowed to him rather than to Jesus. And that wasn't are uh, written in the uh, annals of God. God had written in the annals of God that his son was going to be the mediator, not Lucifer. Lucifer at that time was an angel. Uh, and now he is an angel still, but he is a fallen angel. He has lost what he was given by God originally. Now coming back down to Noah's flood. Let's look at Noah's ark and Noah's flood. A lot of people think, well, it rained 40 days and nights, and that was the end of it. And then it talks about 150 days, and they think, well, maybe Noah got out in 150 days. No. <clears throat> Let's look and see how long Noah was in the ark. Let's start in chapter 7 and verse 6, where God decides to destroy the wicked uh, humanity, and he orders Noah to build an ark in Genesis 7. And Genesis 7 and verse 6. Let's look at it. It says, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And God told Noah to build this ark. And let's look at uh, 4 through 10. Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, were to enter into the ark. And they were the eight souls that were going to be saved out of a total populated earth. You say this earth was totally populated, Brother Peter. Yes, this earth was covered completely, the whole circle was covered 
by people 1656 years of no birth control of men having more than one wife monogamous uh, they weren't monogamous they were uh, opposite of that they had many wives men did they lived many years we have a uh, history right here before me somewhere I had it a few minutes ago of the oldest man Methuselah he lived 969 years Let's say he didn't start even have children until he was 69 years old. So, he could have started having children at 69, and for 900 years, he could have had children. And by the way, uh, that was only half the age of the flood. The flood was uh, uh, 1600, 1500, 1656 years, excuse me. And so here's a man that was only 969. So here's another man, Jared. He was 962. Noah himself lived to be 950 years. So Noah was 600 years old. So Noah only had the three sons and the daughter that were, I mean, three sons that were there at the time and the wife. If Noah had had other children and there are somewhere else in the world, we don't know that. We know that he had three sons and his wife with him. Now, there was uh, Adam. Uh, lived 930 years. Seth lived 912 years. Canaan lived 910 years. And Enos lived 905 years. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 men that lived over 900 years and a, a, a more than likely all bore children during that period of time. And that would be thousands and thousands of children. Now just imagine that if they started bearing children again at the age of just 50, each one that had children and those children started bearing other children at the age of 50, and they lived five or six hundred years, and they had children all these years, how many that would be? It would be literally on a daily basis, thousands and hundreds of thousands being born worldwide. And so children this earth was multiplied plenished that's why that after the flood that's why we have in our area here we have dinosaur bones in our area here we have oil pockets underneath the united states in this area and even though everything we look at over there at the flood was over around mount air right now but we have all that stuff buried here too now what are the pockets of oil the pockets of oil are decayed matter. Decayed matter. When God uh, uh, took this earth and turned it into liquid, when you liquefy earth enough, and it will become running, and it will it, things will just sink into it and melt, and that's what happened. And <clears throat> the earth was liquefied for some uh, 300 days. We'll say 150 at first. And then the water started subsiding, and we had water on this earth for like uh, 377 days. There was water on this earth that covered this earth, and, and as it subsided, the earth hardened itself again. The sun, I'm sure, God had the sun out by then, and the earth was getting harder and harder and harder, and God, and God was hardening the earth back up. But uh, during that period of time, it was solidified, and as it solidified, the animals and the vegetation and the trees, everything went down underneath. Now, God made a plan to maintain some of that stuff. We know that that dove came back with a leaf of an olive tree. In order for that dove to do that, God spared that olive tree for a reason. And... We don't know if any other trees were spared at that period of time. That uh, as the earth was solidified, though, and the, all its vegetation and stuff went down into it, the dinosaurs. My personal belief is that uh, when this earth was a solarium and there was water over the earth and water uh, on the earth, that the solarium type effect, that things grew big, large, and God had to have big lawnmowers. That's why He had the dinosaurs. And but after the flood, he didn't need the dinosaurs anymore because vegetation was not going to grow anymore like it did. It was not the trees were not going to grow 300 feet tall like they were. 
the grass was not going to grow six, seven feet tall like it did, the lawn grass and the stuff. And so he didn't need those lawn mowers anymore. So he did away with those dinosaurs. But anyway, back to the reality of the flood. The flood was real. The flood really happened. And the ark did land on Mount Ararat, just like God said it did. God did uh, shut the door when they, they came in. God was in the ark, said, come in. And all the animals came in with him. The reason why, if you want to answer a question to a question that you may have in your mind, why did God tell Adam to take seven of each kind? Because when Adam got on, when Noah, excuse me, when, told Noah, because when Noah got off the boat, he built an altar, and he had to sacrifice. And he had to sacrifice animals. And it wasn't God's desire that he sacrificed one of a pair. It was God's desire that he sacrificed that odd one, that one extra one that he took of each animal. He took that extra one so he would have a sacrifice after the ark landed. You say, well, how did uh, Noah gather up those animals for sacrifice? Well, you know what? God told those animals to come into the ark, two by two, and told that one separate one to come in there by himself or herself. And God told that one that he was going to be a sacrifice. And when the ark landed, God said, you are going to be a sacrifice and that's the way it's going to work. And, they, and God used them for a sacrifice. Now the blood of a human being is a loaned thing. It's loaned to a man from God. When God breathed in the broad nostrils, the breath of life into Adam, he put blood in Adam. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God put his blood in Adam and God loaned the blood to man for the lifetime of a man, and then the shedding of blood, the Bible said, covers its sin, and that blood will go back uh, to God. Now, God has a way to do that. You say, how did Jesus gather his blood up and take it and sprinkle it on the mercy seat of God at the right hand of the Father? How did he do that? You and I can't answer that. We're not God. God, in his finite being, has a way of doing that. The blood of the flesh, the blood is alive. Do you remember when Cain killed Abel? And God came and said to Cain, Where is thy brother? And he said, Am I my brother's keeper? And God said to him, What did he say? He said, Thy brother's blood doth cry from the ground. Thy brother's blood cries from the ground. His blood was still alive. The body was dead, but the blood was still there. And I'm sure that God captured that blood, took it, put it in paradise where Abraham's bosom was going to be and kept it there until Jesus came. And when Jesus came and took paradise to heaven with him, took all that blood and paradise to heaven with him and set it down before the Father that all of those that from the Old Testament that belonged to God, including Noah, including Noah's sons, including all of Noah's descendants that followed God, uh, were there. Every single solitary person that died a physical death on this earth was in paradise, that died a physical death in God, not those that died in the heathen, the heathens that died that were opposite from God, like Korah and his bunch, where the Bible said the earth was opened up and swallowed them whole, alive into hell, swallowed them alive into hell, that bunch that uh, came against Moses when he came down with the uh, tablets of stone. You can read that in the beginning uh, here. Well, anyway, everything, every single beast was after its kind. Every living creature was after its kind. That does away with this uh, heathenistic statement that everything evolved because God said for Noah to take everything after its kind. When God made a goat, he made a goat after its kind, a cow after its kind, a horse after its kind, a person after its kind, a monkey after its kind, a tree after its kind, all the different trees are after their kind. 
Beautiful, beautiful. So there's some beautiful stories in the Bible about uh, uh, a one tree came to a tree one day and said, how about you being our king? And he said, no, I'm satisfied being a bush. I'm satisfied being what I am. Just like we're supposed to be satisfied with what we are. Let's get back to the flood. Here we are. Noah's in the flood. Uh, the waters are fixing to come. And it's going to rain. Uh, Noah and them, they came into there with every clean beast, every fowl of the air, and then for seven days, and I will cause it to rain. They sat inside of that ark for seven days before God shut the door. Now, the seven days they were in there was from uh, one, um, it was from one, what was it, what was it, what was it? One high day, one Sabbath to another Sabbath. From one Sabbath to another Sabbath, seven days. And God gave grace for seven days for anybody that was outside of the ark to enter into the ark. Yet nobody did. Nobody took that grace off of it. God had, and God closed the door, and the rain began to come and destroy that for that day. And uh, I wish I could find that uh, little thing I had here. Uh, wrote down here on the the uh, the days that that were here. Okay, I don't see it. Anyway, so uh, God decided to destroy the wicked uh, amongst the humanity. He ordered Noah to build the ark, and Noah built the ark. And Noah was six hundred years old. Noah, his wife, his three sons entered into the ark. Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their sons' wives, and a pair of living creatures entered into the ark. 7, 4 through 10. Now we can read that. In verse 9, it said, They went in two and two under Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass, after seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. After God closed the door in seven days, the water started breaking up from underneath, the diluge that God had set in the heaven, above the heavens, that did cover this earth before, was still there. And God brought it back down. He broke up the earth from beneath, and he brought the water back down, and he covered this whole earth. Uh, approximately, I understand from some people who are calculators or whatever, 31 furlongs above the highest mountain. 31 furlongs above the highest mountain. That's about 90, I don't know if that's 90-something feet or 100 feet above the highest mountain the water was upon this earth. In other words, this earth it was returned to its original state again. <clears throat> and then we started over again when Noah and his eight together landed here, took the animals he had, and started over again. Now, on day 10 of month 2, of the, the year that Noah entered the ark was uh, and he went to day 17 on month 2 of that and that took seven days embarking uh, off in the, for the ark to float and then the rain began in Genesis let's look at 7 and 4 to 6 let's look at um, verse 11 and verse 12 it said, in the 600th year of Noah, uh, Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventh day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So it rained continually for forty days and nights, the diluge. Now that doesn't mean it completely stopped raining or anything but the diluge was 40 days and 40 nights and and it landed and then uh, uh, the rain lasted 40 days and nights the water prevailed 150 days Genesis 7 and 24 Genesis 7 and 24 says <clears throat> and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days you don't have to calculate I ain't got to try to figure anything out. The Bible says it for you. 100 
and fifty days the flood was upon it. Okay, I found this little note I was looking for. Eleven, eleven of the flood dates that are written down, the dates, like the day 10th of month 11, the day 11th of month 11, uh, those days were, were uh, Sabbaths. They were Sabbath days. They were Sabbath days when God spoke and said things about it. They were on Sabbath days. Eleven of them were <coughs> during the flood time. Okay, that was an important thing to me. Uh, the ark came to rest on Ararat, Genesis 7, 24, and 8 to 4. So let's look at that and read a little bit about that. It only take a minute. Uh, and we're going to go to uh, 8 and 4, from 7, 24 to 8 and 4. Now 8, it said, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth. And the waters are swagged, or the waters were moved off the earth. And God was drying up the earth. And as the wind moved the moisture, it became clouds in the skies. And it was moved away. And you don't have any question. You haven't got a question what God said he did. He did it. People would say, well, where would all the water go? In the first place, they wondered where the water came from. I told you that. In the beginning, this earth was covered. It was all water. It said, And the fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. Now what did that make? That made three hundred days. That made 300 days at the end of 150 days, said, see? Because he had been 150 days already when he landed on Ararat. And then 150 more days of a wind blowing to, to obey the water, or swag the water, take it away, and make clouds out of it and put it away. And the water returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the water was abated. See, it, it for ten, continually... For 150 days, the water was being a swag. You can read it right here. I just read it to you. Now, that takes away the question. Verse 4. And the ark rested in the seventh month, in the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountain Ararat. In the seventh month, in the seventeenth day of the month. It was on Ararat. And the water was fully receded. Now 8 and 3 said, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. Now, okay, verse 6, and it came to pass the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. I have not studied the 40 days that Noah waited there. And I should have because God did many, many things in 40 days. Remember, Noah went up and got the, the I mean, uh, Moses went up and got the covenant 40 days. Uh, had to go up a second time for 40 days, made 80 days. But Jesus fasted 40 days. Many things in the Bible were 40 days. The children were 40 years in the wilderness. For every day that they did something, they spent a year in the wilderness. And so the 40 is a big, a big thing to, to look at. So anyway, the 40 days, and uh, all right. And uh, verse 7, And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, until the waters were dried up off all of the earth. Off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Verse 9, but the dove found no rest for his sole of his feet. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the earth, whole earth. Then he put forth his hand, took her, pulled her into the, in, unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days. He stayed another seven days. 
Now, the day he sent the dove out, and the day that he stayed another seven days was representative of the seven days at the first of it. And then God finished up his work, drying the earth enough so that uh, Noah and his group could start out of the ark. Had they got out of the ark the minute it landed, and the waters, the the the, the water could be stopped, even the water could be gone. But if you step in mud that's been underwater for a long time, you go neck deep or even out of sight. So God had had my, uh, Noah wait until the water was wet. Verse ten, and he stayed yet another seven days. Verse eleven, and the dove came unto him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And that's in chapter 8. Verse 12. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove which returned not again unto him any more. Now you know that he sent the dove out. The dove is a clean animal. The dove won't eat anything dead or dirty. The dove is only a clean thing and it won't land on things that aren't clean. It is a very clean bird. It's absolutely clean. The cleanest bird there is. It doesn't have garbage in its craw. The things it has in its craw are only good, clean things. That's all it eats. And it came to pass on the 605th year, first year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up off, off from the earth, and Noah removed the covering off the ark, looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. You remember another time God's going to dry up some water? When Moses has to cross the Red Sea, God dries a path up, and the people walk through on dry ground, and God blows a, a wind, a breath of wind across there. And God dried the earth up, and the ground was dry. And on the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. Dried. Do you know what? Noah spent 377 days in the ark. Did you read in the beginning why Noah had to bring enough food in? to feed all of the animals and his family for 377 days. He had to bring enough food in there to feed everybody on that ark for 377 days. Plus, when they landed, there was not something to eat left on the earth. And they landed on Mount Ararat, up there where they landed. Perhaps <clears throat> Mount Ararat was the place where the least time of water covering was and there was still some vegetation or something. But he's going to turn loose all the animals of this world and his family and they're going to have something to eat on a place that's not been planted yet. We find out that after the flood, God spake unto Noah saying, Go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife, thy sons and thy sons' wives, and bring forth thee every living thing it is with thee, all flesh, both fowl, cattle, every creeping thing upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So God's saying, go out and have children. Go out and have babies. Go out and breed. Go out and make this earth fill back up with animals. Now, do you think Noah said, hey, God, what are they going to eat? God, what are they going to have for food? No. If God tells them to breed and make more children, God plans on feeding them. And he's going to make the vegetation. He's going to make what they need to eat with. To eat. They said every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl of the air, whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after its kind, went forth out of the ark. Remember now, everything went in after its kind, everything came out after its kind. I'm suspecting that perhaps uh, there were many births pretty much immediately after they went out of the ark. That uh, many 
uh, breedings took place in the ark and many animals were ready to have young upon the earth. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered a burnt offering unto the altar. There's that last one that God told him to bring in. That one extra one, clean one, that God told him to bring in, he sacrificed on the altar. Now he took every one of those. I'm uh, almost of a belief that uh, Noah had a special room that all of those singles were put into and they were kept for that 377 days just for the time that he was going to build the altar and uh, have it. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in, in his heart, you want to see God has a heart? The Lord said in his heart, I will not again cause the ground any more for man's sake for the emanation of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite imagination any more everything living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. He made a perpetual earth. A perpetual earth. Have you ever knocked a glass over and it start rolling and roll one way and then it roll back and roll one way and it roll back? I remember one time when I was young, my daddy somehow knocked a glass over in the cupboard or something. And he said, y'all don't touch it. Let's see how long it would do it. And it rolled for, I don't remember how long. It seemed like days. It may have been weeks. It just perpetually just kept going. It rolled one way and then it rolled other. It rolled back and it rolled other. It must have been something in the glass that had the balance of it to where it would do that. But that was perpetual motion. Perpetual motion. God made this earth to perpetually reproduce itself. Do you know that he made man to perpetually reproduce himself? Do you know that when we were designed, we were not designed to die. We were designed to remake ourselves every seven years. We shed every day parts of our body, and our body remakes itself on a, on a regular basis. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea under your hand are they delivered. God said, I'm going to give you Moses, you are uh, 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 Noah and your children a power over the animals of this earth and you're going to know you've got to eat. And that means that you're going to have to take some animals to have meat. You're going to have to take and grow some vegetables to have what you need in the and there you're going to be able to eat fruit off the trees. You're going to have to have some fish to eat. So he said, I'm going to give you the power to be able to get these animals and to grow things and have to eat, and what I give you to eat, wild, like uh, you don't have to grow figs, they grow wild on a tree. You don't have to grow coconuts, they grow wild on the tree. There's many things that you do not have to grow. God put them here, and they grow for those people in that area where they are. And every moving thing and living thing, but listen to this. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. I will require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. He's saying there will be no taking of blood. You are not to kill another man for food purposes and you are not to eat another man for food. Man is not to be for food purposes. 
And he's saying if you shed the blood of another man innocently, an innocent blood like Cain did Abel in the beginning, then you will be uh, punished severely in, in the depths of hell for that. And your, your life should be shed. If, if you are in that day and you kill somebody and the rest of the town knew it, that you deliberately killed a man, they ought to take you out and stone you and kill you. And that was, that was the punishment for that in that day. And uh, be ye fruitful and multiply and bring abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. He says it twice. He says multiply, multiply. Multiply, multiply. He says it twice. So he's saying, go ahead. You fill this earth up. Why? Man was made in God's image. Man was made to worship God. God made man that man would worship him. And God's desire is that man does worship him. And that's his desire. So all men that do worship him have everlasting life. And that one day they're going to be the bride of Christ. And in order for God's bride to be complete, complete, there's a certain number. And God knows that number. One day God's going to say to the last man that's going to be saved, the last man's going to say, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart, forgive me of my sin, God, and, uh, and come into my heart. And God's going to say, okay. And then he's going to say, come up hither, everybody. <laughs> everybody that's saved is going to come up hither and be with him. Then there's going to be that thousand year reign. But anyway, if you want to for yourself, get you a good Bible with good side reference and good notes in it. Start studying it and see how that, it, that, uh, that uh, Noah spent 377 days in the ark. And you will be uh, amazed at what you can learn there. And then after the ark, the three boys, Japheth, he started, him and his wife started in Asia Minor, the place on the earth called Asia Minor, and uh, the Caucasus and Europe. He started those continents over there. He started multiplying people on those continents. He also started the Russians, the Kulls, the Germans, and the Britons uh, in a place, and they call that place Gomer. And then he started another place, Magog. And that was the Scythians. Then he started another piece of land, a little place, called Media. That's where the Medes are. And then he had this other little place, Jovan. That's the Greeks. And then Turbo. Uh, uh, that's the Iberians. And then Meshach. That's the Muscovites. And then uh, Terrace. And that is the Tarsians. Now you say... How did he do all of that? Well, the first year that he had children there, by the time they were 15, 18 years old, they started having children. By the time they were 15, 18, they started having children. By the time they were 15, 18, they started having children. It wasn't long, and here you have a man has moved over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different little continents over there and made eight different groups of people. And all the people came from the same father, which was Japheth. And that's where they came from. All those people came from Japheth. And they started over there. Now in the middle has Ham. And Ham, he started Arabia. He started the Egyptians, the North Americans. And he started Cush, the Ethiopians. And he started Mizpah, that was the Egyptians. He started Put. That's the uh, uh, Laodiceans. He started Canaan. That was the Canaanites. Now later on in this book, you're going to read this Bible and you're going to study. You're going to find every one of these people. Every single one of them, you're going to find them. You can trace them back to their roots and find out what kind of people they are. And they're going to be. By tracing them back to their roots. Then we got Shem. Well, Shem come along, he did the Middle East people. Elam, he started. And that was the Edomites, and that was the Persians. And then Asher, that was the Assyrians. 
And then uh, I fix it. That's the Chaldeans. And then Lud. That was the Libyans. And then Aram. And uh, that was the uh, Cyrenes and the Armenes. <laughs> Armenes. I can't say it. But anyway. You see out of these boys. Three boys. And you see two, four, six, eight. 10, 12, 14, 16 different little continents started. 16 groups of people started out of these three boys. Not counting now what Noah and his wife, back where they were, were taking care of and how things were going there. Do you say, do you think Noah perhaps had uh, some other children? I don't, I don't know. I, I would have to dig into that and see after the flood if Noah did have other children. Because he lived to be 950 years. And he's only 600 years now. So he's got 350 more years. And those 350 years, he may have had some more children. I, I haven't studied that. I haven't studied that. And uh, probably maybe some of you out there say, well, Peter, I could enlighten you on that. I know. Well, if you know, I'm glad you know. And I will look up and study it for myself and find out whether he did have some other children after the flood. All I got to do is get my little book out that says all the men in the Bible and read about him and it'll tell me whether he did or not. So we had Genesis chapter 1. Genesis was started. And then we had the fall of Adam and Eve in chapter 3. We had the first murder in chapter 4. Uh, and then uh, in chapter 7 we had the flood. 1656 years after God made man. Man fell and moved that far away from God. So that he made the flood. And then right after the flood. We find out at the Tower of Babel. That the, uh, there was a guy named Nimrod. And God said for the people to go out around the earth and remultiply and fill the earth. Instead, Nimrod said, I'm going to make one place and build a tower up to heaven. And all the language was the same in that period of time. And God said, I'm going to confuse you. And that's why it's called the Tower of Babel. Babel is the word that means confusion. And so God made confusion there. And so... Everything was confused. Then Adam was called, I mean Abraham was called, excuse me. Abraham was called out of the Earl of Chaldees, and God told him to go uh, where he would, and he said, I'll do what you say, God, and he headed out and he did it. And then we have uh, so many people on the earth that we begin to have a war. And then we have some first battles, the 14th uh, thing that happened in Genesis 14. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, they rebelled completely against God and uh, gave themselves over to homosexuality and God came down and destroyed, destroyed the whole place. In that same chapter, 19, he said, if there's any in your group, uh, Lot, that looks back, I will turn them to a pillar of salt. And his wife looked back and she was turned to a pillar of salt. Then we have the Patriots come on, chapter 20 through 2 through verse 50. That's Abraham to Joseph. Abraham to Joseph. Well, our time has come and gone for the uh, uh, auspices of not wanting to be over a certain amount of minutes because uh, after a while, a lot of people do not like to study this many minutes at one time. And what I do... With these things, these little things I do is they're little studies is what they are. And I did this little study here and I've been working on it today for a few hours and then I get into it and put it down uh, on words here. But I had to get into it first. She said, Brother Peter, how many times have you studied it? Well, probably 40. But the thing about it is, is you have to totally refresh each time you get in. And the older you get, the worse off you are for, for being able to uh, not say not say Moses when you're supposed to say Noah. And that's one of the problems you have when you get a little age on you. It begins to happen to you 
that way. Well, our time has come and gone. This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. And we'll see you next time. I'm going to let this thing get to 45 minutes. That's a few more seconds. Uh, may the Lord bless you today.